Listen. Do you hear them? Do you hear the bells? Bells? I don't hear any bells, mister. Well, I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, the heat's got you. Well, you're in the middle of the desert right now. There ain't any bells within a hundred miles of here. But there must be. There has to be. Murderer? No! 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 no. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Death Tolls a Requiem. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Max Ehrlich is Death Tolls a Requiem. I came into the room and quietly closed the door behind me. It was a room ready and waiting for death. The curtains were drawn, blotting out the bright afternoon sunlight. The air was hot and stifling, a silence oppressive and unearthly. I stared down at the face of the old man in the bed. The old man I hated. His eyes were closed, two sunken shadows against the white wrinkled skin. His waxen hands hung limply over the coverlet. For three days he'd lingered while I'd waited for him to die. Now for a moment I thought... But no, his pale lips moved. <laughs> How are you feeling, Father? I, I'm not long to go, my son. Not long. It's only the bells that keep me alive. The bells? Yes, over there in the tower. I lie here and wait to hear them. They seem to rally me. I live for the sound of them, Father. Yes, Father? What? What time is it? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Peter must be there now, there in the tower, pulling on the ropes, starting them swinging. The Pedwick bells, Arthur. Ah, there they are, my son. Listen to them. Your inheritance. Listen to them ring. Oh, what music they make. What beautiful, vibrant music. They give me the strength, the will to live a little longer. How I hated him, the sentimental old fool, my father. He'd spent a half million dollars to bring those bells over from Pedwick, England, the place of his birth. And with them, he'd brought the bell tower, brick by brick, and the English bell ringer, Peter Griggs. A half million dollars, my inheritance, hung in that bell tower. There was no money left, nothing. My father had lost everything, left me nothing. Nothing but those accursed bells. Ding dong, ding dong. They seemed to mock me, taunt me, jeer at me. I hated the very sound of them. But the old fool in the bed babbled on. Oh, my son, those bells bring back the past to me. When I was a boy in Penwick, I heard them toll out the hour, every hour. I married your mother to the sound of those blessed bells. And I buried her to the sound of them. Stop! Stop raving about those bells! Uh, uh, Stop it! Uh, there's evil in your face. Evil! You cheated me out of my inheritance, no. left me penniless. No. You cheated me, do you hear? No. No. Listen to the bells. Yes, they no. know. No. Can't you hear them jeering at me, mocking at me? No. You're penniless, they're saying. Penniless. Penniless. Die, you old fool. Die. 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 You bought those bells, now let them ring your requiem. The bell 
stopped finally. My father lay there, dead. I turned from his white, still face and half walked, half stumbled toward the bell tower across the grounds of our estate. Something stronger than myself drew me to it. I entered the tower and stared up into the gloomy belfry. Yes, there they were, the bells, gleaming dimly in the half-light, their bronze mouths yawning down at me. And then as I stared up at them, I heard a step behind me. Oh, who's there? Why, it is only me, Mr. Book. It is only Peter. Oh, I didn't see you standing there in the shadow. So you've come in to look at my little brood, eh? You've come to admire my three children. Yes. Ah, Mr. Brooke, in all the world, there are no finer bells than my wee babies. It was none other than Christopher Hudson himself who cast them in the 17th century. I, the master himself. My father rung them, and his father before him, and his father before him. And these... These are the bells my father paid a half a million dollars for. Aye, and he got them cheap, sir. These are historic bells, known to all of England. And the folk of old Pedwick parted with them hard. They gave them as a gift, you might say. Your father gave the town an orphan asylum and a hospital. And now he has the bells. And now they'll hang up there. Forever. Aye, and tis well, for they're in good hands. Your father is of old Pedwick, sir, and like me, he loves the bells and knows what they say when they talk. Peter, I... My father will never hear the bells again. Eh, what do you mean by that, sir? He died 15 minutes ago. Huh? Oh, Mr. Brook, he dead? Yes. Oh, dust we are, and to dust we shall return. So it is written, and so shall it be. Oh, he was a fine man, sir. Thank you, Peter. Both me and my children up there, we'll miss him. I will miss him so. Oh, little Davy, big George. Oh, my beautiful Betty, my pretty hussy. Do you hear? The master is dead. You, you call the bells by names? You talk to them? I like a father to his children, and they talk to me. They talk to you. The bells talk to you. Why, why not? They have tongues, and they have hearts and souls. Come, my babies. The good master is dead. Come, little Davy. Cry the sad tidings. Come, big George, awake. Cry, my heart out. Weep, my winsome Betty. Weep, girl. Weep, little dear. The master is dead. Sing. Sing a sad song, my lazy one. My beloved one. Higher and higher. Weep, weep, my baby. Pour out your tears. Cry out to the countryside. The master is dead. I watched him, fascinated, as he pulled one rope, then another, and worked another bell by means of his foot thrust through a loop and a third rope. The bells rang and clanged, throbbed and echoed, beat against my brain in jangling tones and overtones. I looked up at them as they swayed, and their mouths seemed to accuse me of my father's death. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it any longer. I turned and ran from the bell tower. After my father's funeral, I dropped in at the office of Frederick Denny, my father's attorney and executor of what was left of the estate. There were certain things I wanted to discuss. So you want to tear down the Brook Memorial Tower and sell the bells? Yes, Mr. Denny. From what my father told me, they have considerable value. Yes, Arthur, they do. Their intrinsic value, aside from their worth as historic relics and antiques, runs into hundreds of thousands. I've already had two offers of purchase. You have? Yes. One from a university, one from a museum. Good. However, the bells are not for sale. What? 
Mr. Denny, you know the condition of the estate. Why, why, I'm penniless. Dad left me nothing, nothing. Unless I can realize something from the bills. I'm sorry, Arthur, but the terms of your father's will are quite specific. Then I'll break the will. I'm my father's rightful heir, and whatever I can sell those bells for belongs to me. I'm sorry, my boy. I drew up this will myself, and I can assure you it's airtight. There was nothing I could do. Nothing. I was beaten, and I knew it. And day after day, night after night, every hour on the hour, I heard those blasted bells. Ding dong. Ding dong, they mocked me, taunted me, jeered at me, laughed at me. They seemed to talk to me. They talked to Peter the bell ringer, and now they talked to me. Mocked me every hour on the hour. Oh, I hated them, cursed them, blocked my ears against them, but they kept on ringing and ringing and ringing until I thought I'd go mad. Finally, I could stand it no longer. I had to silence those hateful bells once and for all. I had to still their cursed tongues forever. That night late, I went to the bell tower, fevered, in a kind of frenzy, determined to blot out their voices somehow. I entered the bell tower. Peter was there, ringing the bells. Peter! Hey, Mr. Brooks! Stop ringing those bells! Stop it, I say! Huh? Stop the bells? Yes, now! Now, do you hear? No! No, I will not! Ah. There's evil in your face. You don't like the bells like your father. You hate my little children. You mean them hard. Well, I told you to stop those bells. I'll make you stop. Well, Mr. Brooke, what are you going to... No, no. <coughs> no, no. <coughs> you <coughs> throat. You choke. You'll never ring those cursed bells again. I can't breathe. <coughs> was still. The awful pressure in my head went away. It had been easy to strangle Peter. His foot had caught in the pedal noose of the bell rope. And he never had a chance. Now I had to make it look like an accident, like suicide. I picked the bell ringer up, tied one end of the bell ropes around his neck, and gave him a long push. in the bell tower, like a grotesque pendulum, the rope creaking under his weight. <laughs> well, little Davy up there, Big George, pretty Betty, why don't you talk now, eh? Why don't you talk now? <laughs> mad with the sound of the bells, shaking his fist and laughing at his bronze torturers as he stops them from striking twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Now, here is Arthur Brooke again, continuing his story. There was an investigation of Peter's death. The county medical examiner and I went to the bell tower and looked at the bell rope on which Peter's body had been found hanging. Hmm. The way I see it, Mr. Brooke, it's a clear case of suicide. The deceased fastened this rope around his neck, climbed up on the belfry ladder, and flung himself out into space. Yes, Yes, Mr. Holcomb, it, it looks as though as though he did just that. Mr. Brooke, there's one question I want to ask you. Me? What, what, what is it? Well, a man usually doesn't commit suicide unless he has a motive. Did you notice anything peculiar about this bell ringer's behavior uh, before this happened? Why, why, no, nothing except that he, he was deeply depressed when my father died. You see, my father loved the bells as much as Peter did, and... Mm, that might account for it. 
From what I understand, this English bell ringer was rather a queer duck anyway. What? What's that? Hmm? What? What? Mr. Holcomb, the bells. They're ringing, they're ringing. How can they? Take it easy, Mr. Brooke, take it easy. The tower door is open and wind just came through. Made the bells tinkle a little. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. It, It was the wind. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right, Mr. Brooke. After what you've been through, I don't blame you for being jumpy. Finally, the verdict was official. Suicide. And for two weeks, the bell tower was closed and the bells silent. It was then that I had an idea. I went straight to the executor of my father's estate, Mr. Denny, and told him what was in my mind. Arthur, I'm sorry, but what you ask is impossible. We can't take those bells down. But, Mr. Denny, you've read the papers. This bell ringer's suicide has made a mockery out of the tower. All the cheap publicity in the newspapers, the sensationalism, the people coming to stare at the bells, why, why, I feel that my father's memory is being desecrated. I know, Arthur. The whole thing's been very unfortunate, but we cannot let you tear down the tower and sell the bells, as you know. Yes, yes, I know. The will, my father's will. Precisely. And his last wish must be respected. Very well, let the bells stay. But for the love of heaven, Mr. Danny, can they remain silent? Must they ring anymore to remind everyone in town of the tragedy? Your father specified that they must be rung on the hour, every hour, just as they did in England. And that's the way it'll have to be, Arthur. We're already negotiating for a new bell ringer. Mr. Denny, listen. Listen, do you hear them? Hear what? Bells. Bells? Yes, can't you hear them? Can't you hear them? You, you must hear them, Mr. Denny, you must. Oh, yes, I do now, very faintly. Your sense of hearing, Arthur, is remarkably acute. Those bells are from the next town, Silver Valley. Sometimes you can hear them here when the wind's right. Oh, why don't they stop? Why don't they stop talking? Talking? Bells talking? What do you mean? Oh, nothing, nothing. Look here, Arthur, something's wrong. You're on edge, ill. Why don't you go away for a good long rest, say a month or so, it would do you good. Go away. Yes. Yes, why not? Rest. That's what I need. Rest and quiet. Away from the bells. <laughs> It was a quaint that Lee and I knew in the mountains, a hundred miles away. The food was good, and a golf course nearby, and, well, I made reservations. For a week, I ate, slept, played golf, rested. And then one afternoon, I was in the lobby of the inn, chatting with the proprietor. Hey, enjoyed your stay here, Mr. Brook? Oh, yes, Frank. Fine, fine. Well, you've been lucky in the weather. <laughs> I never did see such nice weather. Well, Frank, can... what's that? What's what? Do you hear? Bells. Bells? Of course I do. Yeah, from the church at Greenville, two miles away. But why are they ringing? Why are they ringing? Well, Mr. Brook, what's come over you? It's Sunday, and that's... Frank! Lady... Frank, I'm checking out. Checking out? Now? But, Mr. Brook, you made reservations for months. I'm leaving now, do you hear? Right away, just as soon as I can get my bags packed. <laughs> I had to get away from the bells. That was it. That was all I needed. I remembered a place when I went when I was a boy. An island off the sea coast. There was an old fisherman there, a friend of mine, and I knew he'd put me up. The place was miles from anything, from the mainland, from bells. I took a train, chartered a small boat, and spent three quiet days there. Then, on the fourth day, as we were surf casting for striped bass, all right, Mr. Brooke, let's see you cast way out into the surf. Nice long one, that was. Now, if a striper just hooks onto that bait of yours, why, you're going well, What is it, Mr. Brooke? I hear bells. Bells? Why, sure you do. The Coast Guard's testing a new bellboy out on those reefs over there. Oh, what's wrong, Mr. Brooke? You're as white as a sheet. I've got to get away from here. I've got to get away. Bells, bells, bells. Everywhere I went, they pursued me, ringing their accusations in my ears. I left the island, got into my car, drove. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care. I just had to get away from those bells. And then, some days later, I, I was driving through a desert area in the southwest. 
I was deep in the desert, reeling off mile after mile on the highway when suddenly from far off I heard bells. I set my teeth, gripped the steering wheel tight. Enough was enough. I'd fight them now. Fight them to the bitter end. I wouldn't let the master be tear me apart, drive me mad. No! I had to beat them and I'd do it now! I drove on and on and on and the bells followed me. They must come from a train running parallel to the highway somewhere over the rim of the desert. Yes, it must be a train. It couldn't be anything else. Mile after mile I drove and mile after mile the bells followed me. I began to wonder, when would the tracks cross the highway? Tracks always crossed highways somewhere. They just didn't run parallel indefinitely. And then, and then off I hit. I, I saw some trucks and men. It was a construction crew fixing the road. I stopped the car and hailed the foreman. Yeah. What is it, mister? Doesn't... Doesn't the train cross the highway somewhere up ahead? Train? What train? There's no railroad in this area of the desert. But there must be. I hear train bells. Bells? I don't hear any bells, mister. But I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, you must have sunstroke or something. There ain't no train within a hundred miles of here. But there no must bells be. No bells either. There must be. There has to be. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Now I knew what I had to do. I had to go back to the estate, back to the Brook Memorial Tower and destroy the accursed bells I'd inherited. I had to close their bronze mouths, pull out their wagging tongues, smash their glittering faces. They had possession of me. They were driving me out of my mind. I had to free myself of them once and for all. Only then would I be at peace. I headed for home. And every mile, every hour, the bells pursued me, ringing in my ears day and night, pounding and relentless. <laughs> Back at the estate, I went into the garden's tool house, picked out a heavy sledgehammer, headed toward the bell tower. A car was just coming up the driveway. It looked like Denny's, but I paid no attention. I ran into the bell tower and climbed the ladder into the belfry. Now, now is the time. There were the bells leering at me, grinning at me. I'd smash them now, now and forever. I lifted the sledgehammer and brought it down to the first bell. I'll smash it a bit. Why don't you break? Why don't you break? Arthur! Arthur! What are you doing up there in the belfry? I'll smash them! I'll break them to a thousand pieces! It's the last thing I do! Arthur! You've gone mad! Stop it, I say! Stop it! Why don't they stop ringing? Why don't they stop? No! No, don't! Don't say it anymore! I can't stand it any longer! I can't! I can't! I can't! Williams, I must compliment you on this mental institution of yours. It's run very efficiently. One of the finest in the state. Thank you, Professor. Oh, and by the way, it must be close to midnight. I didn't expect to stay here this late, but uh, it was so interesting. And what is the time, anyway? Well, I don't have a watch on me, Professor, but... Uh, uh, just a second. Listen. The bells! There they go again! There they go! Can't you hear them? Stop them! Ah, the time now, Professor Alvin, is exactly midnight. How do you know that, Doctor? That patient you just heard, Professor, the one who just cried aloud, is a very remarkable case, a human timepiece. He has no watch, of course, but every hour on the hour, he hears bells. He hears bells every hour on the hour? Precisely, Professor Alvin. And he's never more than a second or two out of the way. <laughs> So a man lies on a bed in a padded cell and hears the bells ringing, ringing, every hour on the hour, just as he once heard the real bells strike twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs>
Remember to be with us again when death tolls a requiem and the clocks strike 12 for... Murder at Midnight. The part of Arthur Brook was played by Michael Fitzmaurice. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. <laughs>